This morning's scripture, once again, comes from the book of James. We are going to be starting in the middle of chapter 3 and then going on through into chapter 4. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor better, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes a fight and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Will you please join me in a moment of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When we get behind the wheel, we probably all have different triggers that really get to us. For some of us, it might be that how there are some people who seem to be allergic to their turn signal. For others, it might be that there are drivers who, w who must wish they were in a NASCAR because they seem to always be right on our bumper trying to catch a draft. And for others, it might be that guy who rushes to get in front of us and then as soon as they do, drives slower than we are. Whatever it is for you, we all have things that make us wonder how the people on the road with us ever got a driver's license in the first place. Now, statistically, that is how most of us feel about the majority of the people we share the road with. Surveys have found that most people believe only about 10% of other people are excellent drivers. But there's a weird statistical paradox here. Because surveys have also found that 73% of people believe that they are excellent drivers. This means that three-fourths of drivers be believe they belong to a group that they think only one-tenth of drivers belongs to. Which means the reality is most of us are likely overestimating how good of a driver we are. Because if we were all as good as we think we are, then there would be less accidents because 94% of car accidents are caused by driver error. If we were all as good at driving as we think we are, then turn signals would always get used. There would be less people being cut off and there would be less accidents. And I think a similar overestimation can happen in other areas of our lives as well. This morning's scripture is a good example of that. 
This morning, Scripture has some harsh indictments. And we can easily believe that, well, those don't really apply to me. After all, it mentions wanting to kill to get what we want. It mentions fighting and quarreling. And we can easily think, since I am not very violent, this is talking about somebody else. Making that assumption, though, is just as big of a mistake as assuming that you are the only good driver on the road. Because the reality is, all of us make driving mistakes sometimes. And no matter how good we are, at times we are going to be somebody else's example of a bad driver. In the same way, this morning's scripture is a reminder that we may not be as humble and God-honoring as we like to think we are. This morning's scripture can also be a mirror to help us see some of our own shortcomings and inspire us to be who God has made us to be. One of the elements of the book of James that is often lauded is how it manages to bridge two cultures. The writing in James uses rhetorical devices and language that resembles the popular moral philosophy of the Greco-Roman world yet it is also rooted in the Jewish background. For instance, in the Jewish tradition found that we find in the Proverbs, wisdom is almost always defined as the type of thinking that draws one closer to God, which is lifted up in this morning's scripture. We also see how this scripture bridges two cultures because one of the key elements of Greek philosophy is an emphasis on duality. And Jew and Jewish wisdom literature, like the Proverbs, tends to focus on practicality. And both are present here in this morning's scripture reading. Because in here we find this dual idea of of heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom, which is carried through to the idea of either having a friendship with God or a friendship with the world. Yet these concepts are not just presented as a theoretical they are presented in practical terms of how the of how these two du- extremes of duality can influence our actions. This morning's scripture tries to define for us what heavenly wisdom and friendship with God look like, not by just telling us what it is, but by telling us what it is not. One of the things that I am constantly amazed by One of the reasons why the Bible is so endlessly fascinating is despite being centuries old, originally written in incredibly different languages and coming from a cultural context widely different than our own, is just how relevant it all still is. Verses 13 and 15 from chapter 3 really stick out to me in this regard when they state, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. This is just as relevant today as it was when James wrote it. Because today, envy and ambition still get promoted as wisdom. A foundational message of our modern world is that the path to happiness is to always get more. This consumer mindset is so pervasive and it is built on envy and selfish ambition. It is so pervasive. Its impact is felt just beyond, well beyond, just the acquisition of stuff. Because one of the other cultural message we get is that pursuing a goal is an ultimate virtue. Because it's never enough to be happy with where we are in life. We are told we should always be hustling, that there are always more gains to make, that there is always a higher peak to reach. We are told that pursuing these goals is worth every single sacrifice we could make and that the ends seem to always justify the means. And there is nothing inherently wrong with working towards goals. There is nothing wrong with the idea of even working to acquire something. But more often than not, 
the cultural message is one that is motivated just by the idea of getting more to have more. It is motivated by selfish ambition and bitter envy. Greed and selfishness are recast as virtues, treated like wisdom. After all, our culture celebrates billionaires who hoard more wealth than they could spend in a hundred lifetimes, and we are told they are geniuses. We are led to believe that sitting on enough money to fix world hunger and just holding on to it is somehow the pinnacle of human achievement. One of the lessons that many of us are taught early in life, one that is treated as wisdom, is to always ask, what's in it for me? This question, though, it's not wisdom. It's folly. It comes out of selfish ambition and bitter envy. It's a question that ensures that we are always looking out for ourselves above all else. And the problem with looking out for number one is that it's a full-time occupation. If our primary approach is to always ask, well, what's in it for me? then we have no spare space in our lives to put others first, to love our neighbors, or to truly love God with all of our heart, our strength, our mind, and our soul. The truth of this morning's scripture that we find in chapter 3, verse 16, is just as true today as it was when it was written. For where you find envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, James does engage in some hyperbolic dialogue to make his point that there is nothing life-giving about pursuing what others have, that selfishly putting ourselves first inevitably leads to conflict with others. As we've established, selfishness as a virtue is a cultural message that we cannot escape. And so it means all of us are susceptible to it from time to time. I think chapter 4, verse 3 then, is especially convicting on this front where it states, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. And at some point, that's been true for all of us most likely. Most likely, all of us have tried to justify or spiritualize our wants. But chances are, most of us have prayed with selfish motive at some point in our lives. This morning's scripture successfully diagnoses one of the greatest problems we have as people living in a fallen and broken world. But fortunately, this morning's scripture also reminds us that there is a remedy In this morning's scripture, we read about the cure for selfish ambition and envy that ails us three different times. It is mentioned in chapter 3, verse 13, where it states that the wise can show they are wise by their good deeds done in humility. It is mentioned in chapter 4, verse 6, when James quotes Proverbs 3, 34, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And finally, it's mentioned in chapter 4, verse 10, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. We often portray the idea of being humble as not wanting to promote ourselves too much or just trying to avoid the spotlight. We tend to treat the definition of humble as reserved and modest, but that's the definition of demur, not humble. When I am not quite, I don't think that gets what humble truly is. I've always appreciated how C.S. Lewis defines humility. He wrote, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, thinking of yourself less. Humility is the antonym of selfishness. When we think of ourselves less, It frees up space in our thoughts and in our hearts. It enables us to get our eyes and our minds off of what's in it for me and instead pursue what is actually worth pursuing. Instead of investing our lives in acquiring the next thing, we can invest our lives in following Jesus and having compassion for others and in loving God. 
And I think the life of Francis Havergal is a good illustration of what it means to walk humbly with God. Francis came to age in Victorian England. She was the daughter of an Anglican priest, and by all accounts, she was an incredibly intelligent woman. She also had a reputation for being beautiful, and she was a remarkably talented musician. Once, while accompanying her father to Germany, a mutual friend arranged for her to have an audience with Ferdinand Hiller, a renowned musician of the time. Hiller was impressed with the songwriting abilities and melodic compositions of Francis, so she had all of the makings to be the Victorian version of a pop star. She could have pursued fame and fortune, but that's not what she did. Instead, she lived a quiet, reserved, and by most measures of the world, unremarkable life. She was heavily involved in the life of her local church. She was known in her local community for having a sweet disposition, and she was quick to talk about Jesus to anyone who would listen. She invested heavily in the idea of, 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 of sponsoring foreign missionaries and prayed for them all of the time. Unfortunately, Frances Havergill died from illness at the age, young age of 42. Even though she never pursued fame or fortune, she did continue to write poems and music. And one of her sisters managed to get some of these works published after, her, after Frances' death. The written work of Frances Havergill revealed the reason why she never pursued being a famed musician. Because her, her best known poem was eventually set to music. And it beautifully sums up what Frances Havergill valued most in life. She wrote as a prayer, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. She continues on and ends the poem with, take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Frances Havergal became known as the consecrated poet because her life was dedicated to being quietly lived for God. She embodied this morning's scripture that states, submit yourselves then to God. She lived humbly because she did not seek to put herself first, but desired to have the primary focus of her life be on God, fully consecrated to him. She came near to God and could feel God coming near to her. Earlier in the book of James, we are told that God does not change like shifting shadows, that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Acquiring stuff we want can make us happy for the moments, but when we draw near to God, when we submit to God instead of pursuing selfish ambition, then we know more than happiness. We know joy and peace and an assurance that God will lift us up. This is what Frances Havergill experienced in her humble life. She chose that life over pursuing fame and fortune, and I would argue she made the wise choice. This morning's scripture pushes against the cultural message to put ourselves first to always want more, and to pursue selfish ambition above all else. This morning's scripture reminds us of a better way to live. It reminds us that true wisdom is not asking what's in it for me, but true wisdom is to submit ourselves to God. So may we live a life marked by that kind of wisdom, a good life where we act in love and mercy while we seek to walk humbly with our God. May we seek to draw near to God so that we can find that God is drawing near to us. May the prayer of our hearts humbly be, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee.